Hey everyone, this is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology, and today we are going to take a look at your Sun and Rising sign horoscopes for today's lunar eclipse in the sign of Taurus. Now, this lunar eclipse is pretty strong uh, because it is also conjoin, uh, conjunct, I should say, uh, the planet Uranus. So it makes for a little bit more of a uh, potential, potentially erratic, kind of destabilizing, eccentric, but also exciting energy. Um, so we're going to take you through all 12 sun and rising signs today so that you have a sense of where it's falling in your birth chart, what kinds of topics are being activated by house. Before we get into it, don't forget to like and subscribe. Um, share your comments and stories in the comments section. Um, you can always use the hashtag grabbed or send us an email. Grabbed at nightlightastrology.com is the email address. We aggregate your stories and occasionally I do a storytelling episode where I reflect back on transits that we've looked at um, on in the daily astrology and then share the stories that you have uh, dropped into the comment section or emailed us as a way of illustrating uh, those planetary dynamics. And you can learn a lot about astrology by doing this. This is one of the best ways to learn astrology is to share a story and read what other people are going through. I mean, one of the benefits of being a professional astrologer is that I learn astrology every day because I talk to people and you just, you develop this kind of like almanac in your head for all of the transits. Well, <clears throat> especially with eclipses, I would love to hear your eclipse stories. So use the hashtag grabbed and uh, drop a story in the comments section. Or if you feel more comfortable, email us grabbed at nightlightastrology.com. This Saturday, my new class, Ancient Astrology for the Modern Mystic, begins. Uh, it is not too late to register. As of the time I am recording this, uh, which is still a little ways, I record things a little bit in advance, so it is possible we will be out of need-based tuition scholarships by the time this debuts, but you can certainly check the first year course under the courses page, first year course, drop down. This is on the website, nightlightastrology.com. You can learn more about the program. It starts on Saturday, and uh, I'm really excited for a new program. We have a great new group of students. Orientation material has already gone out, but it is not too late to jump, jump in, and we will get that material out to you right away so that you're not missing a beat. Um, sign up soon, though. Don't wait till the last day of this week. We beg you because it's a little harder to get you set up for class. Anyway, um, the class includes 30 online lectures on the year. They're two to three hours each. They meet Saturdays from um, noon Eastern time to about 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern time. There's breakout tutoring sessions with my staff. There's a discussion forum where you can ask questions. My staff answers within a day. So lots of support there for you as you're going through the program. Um, it's a great way to learn about ancient astrology to learn how to read birth charts. It's a skill you give yourself and potentially you can use it in service for others as well. Uh, so the early bird payment is available until Friday. That's it. You have until Friday to use it and then it is gone. Then we have the payment plan. You can spread the pay payments out over a year. And then, like I said, we may have need-based tuition left by, but it's hard to say because I make these videos a little bit in advance. Right now we have some left as of the time of I'm that I'm recording this. It's hard to say where things will be by this time uh, when you're viewing it. So, but apply anyway, and we will let you know if we have uh, option uh, openings. And you know, we may make a little bit of extra space if we have people come in at the last minute. The tuition assistance is there for people who might need just a little bit of help making it possible because you're low income or on, you're on a fixed budget. Um, we don't want astrology to be. Um, something that is available only for people with a certain amount of money. So we try to make some um, some spots in the class available for people like that. Uh, so we hope that that'll benefit you. All right. Well, it's Eclipse Day. And we started looking at the eclipse to open the week as an archetypal signature coming off from Venus's opposition to Uranus and also now the Sun's opposition to Uranus, Mercury's opposition to Uranus. We took a look at this in the monthly overview for um, November as well last week when I had uh, my friend Alex come on the show and we talked a lot about this eclipse and what we think it's bringing. Venus is the star of the show. This eclipse cycle started off with a solar eclipse in Scorpio on October 25th. And that solar eclipse in Scorpio was conjoined with Venus and Scorpio. Now we have a uh, lunar eclipse in the sign of Taurus. And you can see it right here. I've got it set up for horoscopes. And the moon is at 16 uh, just a few hours before this. That's when the eclipse actually happens, Tuesday, November 8th. And, but what's really important to point out here is this, that this full moon falls 
exactly opposite the Sun and Mercury, who is also uh, going through a Kazemi at the exact same time, and both are opposite to Venus. It's a very powerful dynamic, especially considering that both are sort of T-squaring Saturn uh, at the exact same time. So what a, what a dynamic eclipse. It is a truly Uranian eclipse, and it is about breakthroughs, uh, you could say, for Venus. There, there's a, per, a very potent feeling of Venusian things taking some wild twists and turns or experiencing major breakthroughs, which will really change the plot line for each of us in, in different ways. And how is it going to change the plot line? Depending on where it lands in your birth chart. Maybe what planets it's closely conjoined with or square to or opposed to in your birth chart. Um, and But also, very basically, what house it's going to appear in. So that is where we are going to focus our attention first. Um, we're, we are mostly for our horoscopes, what we're going to do uh, whenever horoscopes come up is look at the whole sign house that they land in, because obviously I can't look at your birth chart. So we're going to start with Aries and just mention the kinds of topics likely to be activated, <clears throat> the kinds of events or outcomes or themes you may experience based on the whole sign house position uh, of this tor uh, of this lunar eclipse in the sign of Taurus, um, as it appears according to your rising sign. Now you could use your if you if you are the person who takes in your sun sign astrology every month, that's fine. Just listen to the sign of your for your sun. I recommend your rising sign because in ancient astrology, whole sign houses are used, and horoscopes utilize whole sign houses as well. Which means that if you listen for Aries and you're in Aries rising we will get the exact location of the eclipse by house in your natal chart if you're using the whole sign traditional approach, <clears throat> which is fantastic. So um, if you are an Aries rising, we'll get into it now, the lunar eclipse falls in your second house, which is a house that is related to your money and your resources. It is any kind of resource, um, but often the second house will um, have, have a direct relationship to your financial uh, security, well-being, your salary, um, business earnings, if you own a business, and things like that. So with a lunar eclipse in this house, right on Uranus, opposite those eighth house planets, I like the idea of something shifting so that there's more space, there's more freedom, there's more originality, there's the feeling of uh, greater freedom, a revolution around money and resources that frees you up. That, to me, is the most optimistic interpretation of this lunar eclipse with Uranus in your second house. Of course, the twists and turns and the unexpected jolt of, uh, you know, an expense that could come up or something changing with your income that uh, comes up. It could be sometimes with Uranus a little destabilizing. But generally speaking, with the moon exalted in this sign and with the north node and with Uranus, I like the feeling of this being about taking you forward into the future with greater liberty and freedom somehow around money and resources. Maybe something new is coming into your life or some new form of resource or a change of financial approach that grants you a little bit more ease. With the second house, or with uh, Taurus on the ascendant, we are looking at this eclipse falling into your first house. Body, appearance, identity, um, personal uh, psychology, and um, you could say character. So to me, this is a moment of great breakthrough when it comes to, you know, your own psychology. This is a moment of character development and character evolution. How am I changing as a person with a personality, as a character who's been living a life and has been shaped and changed by the events I've experienced recently. So it's a moment of rapid development in your personal life. It could also be uh, something to do with your physical appearance or body. Uh, sometimes people will, again, I've said this in lots of videos for Taurus over the years because of Uranus being in your first house, change your appearance, change your diet, change your uh, physique, change something about uh, the way you dress. But those changes are coinciding with deeper changes in character and identity. Um, not surprisingly, for example, those of you who follow my channel, I'm a Taurus rising and these eclipses have coincided with me changing my name back to Adam and sort of letting go of a monastic I identity of sorts that uh, just kind of wasn't working for me. I was just kind of ready to move um, to something new. So it's the same kind of thing for Taurus Risings where physical challenges um, uh, that come up that, that also create the opportunity for growth or health challenges that create the opportunity for growth. 
um, as well as any kind of identity, character, or physical, or, or health, or identity-related transformations. So that's for Taurus. Let's move ahead to Gemini. We place Gemini on the Ascendant. Uh, in addition to you having Mars retrograde in your first house right now, you do have the lunar eclipse in your 12th. Now, to me, the lunar eclipse in the 12th with the North Node, the problematic piece of this could be what am I willing to do? What kinds of rules am I willing to bend or break in order to create the personal transformation that I most need or want right now? And some of those rule bendings or breakings might be healthy and necessary, while others may be regressive in some way. And so I would be careful of any kind of youthful, rebellious qualities, overdoing something, or uh, in the name of freedom, sort of self-sabotaging. Um, at the same time, I would look to there being breakthroughs as things in the unconscious tend to come up through 12th house eclipses. And with Uranus, these things coming up, whatever they are from the, the unconscious, your awareness of them could create a substantive breakthrough, which might be simultaneously related to that Mars in the first house. So I like it as a month of daring rebellion. You know, you also want to be very cautious with, again, the rules you bend or break. And then I would also think about, um, you know, the breakthroughs that come up from the unconscious to help you evolve, set you free, or aid in the personal transformation that's really indicated right now for you by Mars's retrograde in your first house. Um, and that could have a more physical dimension to it as well with Mars also being in your first house. All right, let's go ahead to put Cancer on the Ascendant. So with Cancer on the Ascendant, this eclipse takes place in your 11th house, a place of friends, groups, and allies. A lunar eclipse there with Uranus could signal the break from a friendship or a transformation within a circle or group of friends such that you don't want to participate anymore or such that you're joining something new and suddenly um, you know, breaking from something old. But this would probably have something to do with professional circles or uh, religious, spiritual, or academic circles, um, your your colleagues, or uh, social uh, social life, and some kind of change that's happening there that's suggesting a, a greater need for freedom, independence, exploration, experimentation, maybe new people coming into your life as well. Um, I like this one. I think there could also be, you know, themes of of you know looking at what kinds of social systems of support are there for you to grow. Um, you know, an experiment with versus those that are holding you back in some way um, and, and looking at that and how that's working um, within yourself, you know, within your psychology, the need for change and how that's demanding it be enacted in, in, a, in a social hemisphere. So for Cancers, that's the 11th house. For Leos, this is happening in your career house. This eclipse takes place in the 10th house. So here, I like the idea of there being sudden, exciting, creative breakthroughs and developments around work, um, which is, you know, awesome. That is uh, exactly where, you know, one of the, I think one of the places that a lot of people wish that they could probably see such, a, uh, such an eclipse is in a place that, you know, people are often frustrated. I mean, 80% of my clients come to me because they want to know when something is going to feel a little different or when a change might be coming in the workplace. Well, this is an eclipse that brings that kind of change, whether it's a change of job or company, a change of title or description of your duties, something that you're doing is going to be um, shifting. And often with Uranus, it's with an eye for greater freedom, independence, experimentation, creativity, uh, and the like. Now, it can be a little destabilizing, so watch for that sort of sudden shiftiness of this eclipse with Uranus as well. But it's all about the career house for Leos. Well, for Virgo, this is much more sort of philosophical in nature as the eclipse is taking place in your ninth house. Now that ninth house was called God by ancient astrologers and was related to philosophy and our guiding beliefs, as well as things like learning and education, universities, monasteries, libraries, mystical experiences, divination, travel abroad. So for Virgos, I wonder how things are shifting dramatically with regard to school and education. What kind of breakthroughs you might be on the brink of with regard to something that you're learning or studying, new teachers or different subjects that are coming into your life, or maybe even your understanding of a subject you've been studying for a while is taking some kind of big evolutionary leap forward right now. Or maybe you're starting to develop a new practice or 
uh, there's a topic in your life that you're thinking about trying to turn into a business, these would all make sense, as would some kind of adventurous travel, spiritual retreat, um, or something like that. A change of paradigm or a shift of beliefs would also make a great deal of sense. With v Venusian things in mind, where is the goddess? Where is the body? Where is sensuality? Where is love? Where is this earth um, in the mix of what I believe and how freely I'm able to express myself and my beliefs in the world? All right, Libra. So when we get to Libra, we're now on the dark half of the zodiac from the autumnal equinox going forward. Libra puts places, Libra rising, uh, places the eclipse into the eighth house. Now that is the um, place that is associated with death, but it is also associated with um, debts. Well, the ultimate debt we all have in a sense is, um, you know, we all have to, uh, eventually the price we pay to live is to experience death. So the eighth house is all about the people that owe us and the people that we owe. And there's a sense in which who and what we owe uh, our allegiance to is a very healthy and positive thing. Same thing with those people who owe their allegiance and support and love and resources to us. And so it's a place of great sharing but it's also a place that can breed all sorts of complicated debts, emotional and karmic debts. And with this eclipse, I think of getting free from those things that are binding us in unhealthy ways. And I also think of some new kind of resource making itself available that changes or flips the script in a pretty profound way, giving us greater freedom, but also perhaps um, bringing in some kind of new relationship or bond or, or sort of soul contract. Those are the kinds of things I would watch out for, as well as the potential for the metaphorical death card to be drawn um, in a way that is maybe, um, you know, sudden, Uranian, but also uh, liberating. So the death card is, you know, is, is the way I talk about death in the eighth house is almost always figurative, metaphorical, very rarely is it ever literal. So don't get afraid of the eighth house, you know, don't be afraid of it, just kind of assume that there might be some more significant transformations, and some of them may involve letting go. Uh, but that's also um, paving the way often for new kinds of bonds to be formed. So some transformation there. Now, Scorpio's uh, Scorpio sun are rising, this places the eclipse into the seventh house of love and marriage. So first of all, if you're in an existing relationship and you're you're feeling pretty good about it, you've got an eclipse in this house, it will often mean that something significant is going to happen in the life of a partner. Their job is going to change or something about the partner themselves is going to change. And that can be indicated by a seventh house eclipse. On the other hand, the relationship itself can go through some kind of transformation. But again, if you're in a relatively solid place, I wouldn't be worried about a breakup. I would be more concerned about, you know, how are you experiencing, how are you creating a breakthrough? Um, how is the, you know, in what area or in what ways is the relationship ready to evolve? It's a little mini revolution in the house of love and marriage. On the other hand, I could see this eclipse bringing, if you're single, a period of fun and exploration. You know, a lunar eclipse with Uranus is not exactly the committing type of transit, but it is a have fun kind of transit and experiment kind of transit, which maybe leads to something later. Um, but I see this as breaking relationship patterns open somehow into new territory, um, whatever that means. So, uh, you know, and of course you could see that the typical, you know, Uranian disruption of relationships, the need for greater freedom and independence that leads to a breakup, sure. But I think for a lot of people, it's not gonna be like that. It's probably going to be something um, more along the lines of the, the evolution happening in your personal life as it is directly mediated by important relationships. All right, let's go forward and place Sagittarius on the Ascendant. So with Sagittarius on the Ascendant, the Eclipse falls into the sixth house, a place that is sometimes associated with toil, labor, sickness, even slavery in the ancient world. And so with a lunar eclipse with Uranus, and especially an exalted lunar eclipse, I think of the break, breaking free of bondage which means something that you have been frustrated by, something that has represented a toil, maybe even a sickness that you've been dealing with, a pattern of dis-ease that you've been dealing with for a while. And this eclipse, I think, could actually 
be very liberating in the sense of I'm finding something that works, that's helping me. I'm turning a corner. I'm letting go of a frustration or a conflict, or there is a breakthrough where there has been stagnation, frustration, or agitation. Uh, the other thing, of course, would be that a lunar eclipse in this house with Uranus could bring a sudden or unexpected uh, twist of health, for example, like suddenly dealing with something in your body. Uh, that would be not entirely easy. I'm optimistic that it won't be terrible for Sagittarians because we do have the North Node and an exalted moon. And so it feels like it shouldn't be, you know, any kind of disaster scenario here. Um, but I would watch out for the destabilizing effect of Uranus. And the sixth house can be frustrating. And sometimes it's, you know, that's when you get a little bit sick for a while or something. So you could see something like that coming up. My sense is it is in the um, able to be overcome category or that there's a silver lining that goes along with any setback or sudden twist of fate that is more frustrating or represents more of a block. Like if something like that comes up, my guess is it'll be accompanied with the ability to gradually um, recover. Uh, the other thing is that could this frustration or conflict or breakthrough depicted in a, in a difficult sixth house be simultaneously related to changes happening around relationships and love with Mars retrograde in the seventh. I think that's a pairing worth looking at in this case. All right, let's move along to Capricorn on the Ascendant. With Capricorn rising, we have uh, this eclipse in the fifth house. Now for me, I, this is one of my favorites because the fifth house is a place associated with pleasure, joy, creativity, uh, recreation, children and pregnancy, I could definitely see a surprise. I'm pregnant with uh, Uranus and an exalted moon in the fifth house of pregnancy. This would be like, I think the surprise variety of pregnancy or some kind of surprising twist or turn related to, um, you know, children, for example, um, probably something sp special and good. This was called the house of good fortune. My kid makes the honor roll or, you know, there's some unexpected positive breakthrough around my children or within my, you know, my parenting. Uh, I could also see this though, more likely as related to creative breakthroughs, romantic, and um, let's call it sensual um, excitement. Like there's, a, this is kind of, this is kind of like the house where you know, you, you, you had, you know, on the smallest scale, I can think of like a really fun date night where you do something sort of eccentric and memorable on the big scale. I could see this being like a, a really preposterous, but fun one night stand, right? Not that I necessarily encourage that, but you get what I'm saying. So the, the, the eclipse in this house changes the relationship that we have to pleasure and creativity, where we seek it, how we find it, how we need it or like it. Um, and I think that that for Uranus, it, that's right up Uranus's alley. <laughs> I don't know if that was the... <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so that's fun. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. So I will let that fun uh, visual speak for itself. All right. Let's go along now to... Um, Aquarius rising. So with Aquarius rising, we take this eclipse and we place it in the fourth house of home and family. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, and, you know, when I think of a Uranian lunar eclipse in the fourth house, um, I would normally think about significant disruption at the roots, something like suddenly having to move or the, the chaos of moving apartments in New York City, which I went through several times. Or for example, um, you know, the, the grandparent that's, you know, suddenly passes away of a stroke or heart attack. I know that's difficult to hear, but you're thinking about a place that does not really love Uranus. Like you're, this is a place that's all about stability and Uranus very much likes to upset the status quo or upset stability. Now I'm, I'm comforted by the fact that this is a lunar eclipse with an exalted moon. But I could see family dynamics, like the fault lines beneath the surface of family, living environment, home, uh, like like shifting dramatically. Uh, this feels like a, a little bit like an earthquake down, you know, at the roots. And so I, I would be a little bit cautious of the, of the theme of like upheaval, disruption, a little bit of chaotic, uh, you know, 
revolution in the air around home, family, and roots. However, at the same time, Uranus is a planet of great revolution or um, liberation and freedom. And so how are things also getting freed up? And where there is greater freedom, often there is greater happiness. So you might see changes that create more space more freedom and more happiness, especially related to home and family. All right, finally, the Pisces sun and Pisces risings will get this lunar eclipse in the third house. And so that is a place that is associated with, for example, siblings, but also your neighborhood, your immediate environment. It has a certain relationship with the mind and what, what's occupying your mind. I like this in terms of a change of mind and a change of thought a change in terms of uh, your thinking. Often that comes with a Uranian eclipse um, because you're learning something new or there's a new topic that you're getting really excited about. New technology, new cars, a new, mean of, new means of travel. Um, this is the kind of eclipse that comes sometimes when people are writing um, a new piece of music or maybe even they're deciding to write a book or start a blog. You could also see this eclipse related to changes around siblings or changes in your neighborhood or with neighbors. Um, I could also see this being an eclipse that brings about original ideas and the need to communicate them. Um, it, it's ultimately also, it's about, you know, the, the way in which your personal philosophy is uh, changing or evolving right now, and especially needing to accommodate Venus, the goddess of pleasure, love, desire, beauty. Um, so those are the kinds of topics I would watch for if you're a Pisces rising. All right, that's what I've got. I hope that each of all of you who for each sign will leave some stories. <clears throat> Don't forget to use the hashtag grabbed or email us grabbed at nightlightastrology.com. As you experience this eclipse, it's probably not gonna be on the day of the eclipse that you notice the biggest impact, but in the days and weeks following the eclipse. So pay attention, uh, come back to this video. You could even watch it again a few times and see how that those the topics of the house that I mentioned are being activated, not just now, but in the weeks ahead. So that's what I've got for today. And uh, lots of more good, lots more good stuff to come this week. We have more, we're going to do a little bit more exploring of Mars's retrograde in Gemini. We're going to look at two of the previous Mars retrograde cycles later this week, and what kinds of things happen during those periods and what kinds of lessons we can learn from them. Uh, and there's more after that too. So I look forward to more soon and I hope you guys have a great eclipse day today. Uh, and uh, yeah, definitely, def definitely share your stories. I'm excited to read them. All right, take it easy, everyone. Bye.